our first webinar. Uh, if you don't know us already, we're the Center for Sustainable Finance and Private Wealth at the University of Zurich. Um, we're hosting a webinar series that starts with this one and we're going through September, um, potentially going longer, and it's all on the topic of sustainable finance, sustainable investing, coming mostly from our research and our findings and our interactions in the field. Um, so today, we have uh, three guests. Well, we have our main host, which is Falco Petzl. He's the initiator and managing director of CSP. We have Taeyong, who's the Taeyong Kwan. She's the head of wealth manager programs, and she's also doing her PhD here at CSP. Uh, and I, my name is Erin Duddy. I'm doing external research, and I'm also doing more community building exercises. Uh, our topic today is leader or laggard. And we've seen a lot of interest in this topic. So it specifically focuses on understand, understanding the key role of investment advisors, bank, bankers, and family office staff in sustainable investing. Um, and so today we have our guest, Paolo Frazia. Um, he's an impact investor himself, and he has a lot of experience in the field, especially with this topic. Uh, Paolo is going to uh, tell his story about finding support, um, kind of the ups and downs that he went through until he found the right people to support him. And uh, Falco actually um, goes way back with uh, Paolo, so um, they're going to be kind of uh, dialoguing during this time. Um, so yeah, welcome Paolo. Hi, good morning. Thanks, Erin. And thanks to, to Falco and Teon and the whole CSP team uh, since we're talking about support i think the csp has been a, a invaluable resource for myself and for many other uh, next generation impact investors uh, as they're now built and and you've been too generous in saying that i have a lot of experience i actually don't because i started my journey about three years ago now so really it isn't a lot of time but um, i must say it is a lot of learnings uh, mostly positive but also a lot of other learnings which i'm going to share uh, that hopefully uh, by sharing, it means that uh, some of you don't repeat the same um, type of mistakes. Um, so the, I want to focus my um, conversation with, with Falcon with all of you because later on we'll have uh, extensive Q&A. Um, so I'll try to speak as little as possible. I want to focus on, on three main types of support and advisors that I had to look for during my impact investing journey. Um, and the sort of challenges and interesting uh, points in my journey and go out finding them. So the first type of uh, advisors that I'm going to be talking about is um, the strategy consultant type of advisor. Uh, someone who can be uh, next to you to help you um, find what your strategy should be. So how do you go from uh, your existing position to your desired position? Um, the second um, type of advisor that I'm going to be talking about are more informal advisors. How do you build a network around you of people who can help you informally with whom you can touch base with on a more regular basis and more informally? Uh, someone ideally who you don't have to pay. Um, and then the third and final type of um, advisor that I want to be talking about are uh, wealth managers, uh, uh, chief investment officers, asset managers. So the people who actually then help you uh, implement your investment strategy. Um, so starting with the first, um, I received the bulk of my inheritance, as I said, about three years ago. And I was very lucky that I was um, doing my postgraduate degree um, uh, in Boston at the Harvard Kennedy School where Falco was at the time. <laughs> and I remember starting um, a conversation with Falco about, hey, what type of support should I need? And I think um, Falco, with his usual wisdom, said you need to look for someone to really help you with your strategy, to define where to go from uh, these assets that you've inherited now. Uh, in my case, it was mainly a, a big single stock position um, that every day was seesawing up and down uh, and a lot of cash. So it was a you know, good position to start with, but also with, with a lot of risks to then my vision that was an impactful, uh, diversified portfolio. Um, and so long story short, during that summer, I was in between my two years of my postgraduate degree. Um, I was doing an internship and, and Falco took the opportunity to introduce me to some um, uh, strategy consultants. Um, at the, um, and I think that summer was really, really helpful because 
what these consultants helped me to do was to define um, uh, how to um, go uh, exactly where I wanted uh, in a way that, oops, uh, my, my screen disappeared, but I'll keep going. Um, um, to define also my ambitions in terms of impact investing. So what are my returns objectives and what are my impact objectives? Um, and without that clarity in terms of especially the impact objectives, I don't think I would have been able to start on this impact investing journey. Um, and the last thing I want to say about strategy consultants and their important, uh, importance is the fact that they are independent. So the consultants uh, with whom I work was a, a two-person firm um, that was um, that I paid by the hour. So essentially, uh, whether it was pure strategy work or it was um, um, investment advice, it meant that I, I wasn't tied to any pre-existing research or any incentive fees, um, any incentive fees um, that they would um, that, that they would charge. Um, so the I was basically free to only pay them uh, by the time that I used. So in, independence is, is a value that I really, really uh, um, value uh, of, of these advisors and, so, and, and a characteristic that often gets forgotten, uh, especially when it comes to, in the, to investment advice. Uh, often there are fee structures in which um, advisors are incentivized to, um, to then take a, a fee out of the performance of the investment which means that they have an incentive making you invest, uh, which is something uh, of a decision that I would like to reserve for myself. Um, Falco, anything else that I should say about strategy consultants? Um, well, I think what I found fascinating is also the emphasis that you just uh, again put on how important it was for you to really start with developing your vision and what you actually want to achieve. And I think that is something that uh, right, you and me and everybody on our journey has really seen as well in the past years how important it is to really not just jump in um, through like any types of impact investments that are put forth by maybe your bankers, but really first to think a little bit about what your strategy is, what your uh, goals are, et cetera. And that is often, I think, still uh, forgotten, right? To really be diligent, doing your homework a bit and thinking through your strategy first. Yeah, absolutely. Great. And also your point on how valuable it is to actually have independent advisors that you pay by the hour. That is, um, I think, a point that also I will talk about later and it's really important to, to highlight to everybody. I think what's also interesting about your journey, Paolo, is um, you didn't mention it now, but back then when we uh, uh, looked into your situation, you were really thinking about your career too, right? Like how to spend your time. Would you actually outsource everything and pursue a career based on right, this fantastic degree that you got at the Kennedy School or do what you now are doing, right? You're actually full-time managing your wealth, running your own family office uh, with a very sustainable name as well. Would you tell us very briefly about your personal journey and how you came to that decision? Thanks, Falco, for mentioning that. Uh, just uh, your joke about the sustainable name of my family office. I, I decided three years ago to go for 100% sustainability because that was my aim. <laughs> and it I was that. definitely not a very catchy name. And also, uh, I, I find it awfully inadequate now, to be honest, because sustainability is only going to get us so far. Um, I think mm -hmm. we've done so much damage to this world where we almost have to go and repair all this damage and move more into regeneration. So maybe I will change my name in, in the near future. But back to the main point. Um, um, yes, it was also a choice that felt a little bit uncomfortable for me because I had my career. I had worked uh, in banking, in consultancy um, previously, uh, and, and I needed to choose. Okay, do I apply for other jobs or focus on this fully? And I think... Um, the choice was then, and it brings me to the second point of advisors that I wanted to talk about, which is informal advisors and support network of, of choosing, okay, if I have to dedicate time to something like my portfolio, which is not a regular job, it's a very fortunate position, uh, but I have to be you know, very humble about, uh, because it's not something that everyone has the opportunity to do. Um, how do I do it in a way where I truly then keep myself involved, but also have the humility to look for help in, in things that I don't know about. Because of course, uh, while I had worked in finance before, there are so many areas of finance, and especially of impact investing, when you start moving to private asset classes, 
but I definitely didn't know a lot about back then and I still am learning about now. Um, and so what I did decide to do at the time then, and it's still my structure now, was not to start um, a, a regular family office where I hire two, three, four members of staff and, and work together in an investment office, but to keep a more flexible structure where I work on it full time, um, which again is a bit of a luxury and uh, it, it has been the same for the, the last three years, but who knows whether it's going to continue or not. And then surround myself for, with specialized advisors who can help me with the very specific investment needs that I have at the time. And on top of that, to make sure that as part of my full-time role in becoming an impact investor, I surround myself with the right networks of people, of peers especially, of other next generation impact investors, but also of other types of investors, people who have made their own money because they just started a, a big tech startup and exited. Um, uh, people come from more traditional um, uh, wealth uh, um, uh, and, and really compare notes with these people in a way that can be very informal, like going to conferences. Uh, and there, of course, are uh, various conferences in impact investing, sadly not at this time due to coronavirus, but I'm sure they will resume soon. Um, and maybe there are too many actually conferences. So a part of the, the choice that I also had to face with my time was to really choose the ones that added the most value to my, uh, um, to my career. Um, and on top of that, I also find ways of having maybe a bit of a more formalized informal network. And I know that it sounds a bit oxymoronic, but what I mean by this is, uh, and I'm going to offer, you know, the solution that I and my peers have found was to really start forming a bit of tighter circles. Part of it is natural. There are naturally, you know, the, the, the five or six people who I now discovered kind of think in the same way as me but I surround myself with, we share due diligence materials with, and, that, and that's fine. But also through Tonic, which is one of the impact investing networks that I'm a member of, I have decided with a group of people to, um, there's eight of us, to come and meet every quarter. And um, by meeting every quarter, it sort of feels like we have this uh, personal board of directors type of dynamic where we can discuss both uh, you know, purely work issues, but also what's more interesting, uh, issues that are at the intersection of personal and professional, uh, because those usually are the toughest, right? Um, for example, I, you know, I'm going through a tough time with my husband or wife, and we can't agree on what our philanthropic strategy should be. I mean, this is the type of issue that I do bring to these uh, informal networks. Uh, because then you get really, really valuable feedback. And it's something that I wouldn't be able to do if I decided to just completely go it alone, if that makes sense. Wonderful. So, Paolo, um, we're now at about 50 participants, and there's a good number of next gens there, too, that are sort of at their starting um, position. So for the sort of last um, minute before we go to the next piece of content, what is your piece of advice, your nugget of wisdom in regard to... Uh, advisors, how to differentiate the good from the bad, how to proceed as an excellent who's starting out. Oh, wow. The, the, the one nugget of wisdom. I think the, the one nugget of wisdom is to really, do the, to really do your due diligence, which is something that I did for some advisors and I didn't for others. As in, make sure that you don't just go for the first person who comes and um, tries to sell you their wares and provide their services, but to really have a look at a variety of different advisors, and a, a different variety of types of advisors, whether they're independent strategy consultants, whether it's an informal network, whether it's, it's a wealth manager, um, and really find the type of advisor and then the specific people who are gonna be working with you for the long, for the long term. And it's really about the people in the end. So the time spent at the beginning in really doing this landscaping and selection is really worth then, um, for the long term. Do you usually go by peer recommendations and, and do interviews or how do you do that? Just really quick, yeah. sorry, really quick. <laughs> uh, absolutely, I mean, peer recommendations are fantastic, absolutely, because then um, peers usually can be very open about the good, the bad, and the ugly. And the, the secret is also a little bit about talking about the, the ugly and the bad, yeah. because we, we often tend to only especially when we give recommendations to focus on the, on the good. 
but to, you know, very gently, but prying also on like, what are the points of improvement? I think that that's very important. And then after that, absolutely, I think you have to be a little bit scientific and, um, and kind of stack all these types of advisors against each other and identify the key trade-offs. Yeah. Um, and again, it, it is a, a bit of an effort, especially if, you know, unlike me, let's say you have a full-time job and you can't dedicate as much time. But again, I think that's probably the time best spent because once you find the right people to accompany you on this journey, then you have the freedom to pull back as much as you want. Yeah. And what's important for that is really to have a network of like-minded investors, right? As you mentioned. And you mentioned briefly Tonic. I'm very happy we also have Christine Siegel actually here on the call, the manager of the T100 community, the 100% club of Tonic that I can highly recommend all of you to reach out to. Uh, that's one of the networks that Paolo mentioned, Tonic, that's a network of uh, high net of individuals who are sharing their experiences also with advisors. And of course, we also at CSP facilitate those types of conversations through dinners, et cetera. And I uh, gathered from you, Paolo, that this was a very important source of advice for you, right? These types of networks. Absolutely. Great Wonderful. type of advice, but not necessarily just about the technical aspects. Yes, those came through. But as I said before, especially about the human aspect, about gaining clarity on who am I, what is my unique contribution to the field, what is my impact strategy? Because if you have clarity on that, then you can move on to the how. Wonderful. So thank you for your journey, sharing that with us. And we will have time for some questions at the end. I think you also mentioned at some point you've got to be a little bit scientific. So that's where we could jump in now. And I would share some results of um, our research in regard to advisors. Should we do that, Erin? Yeah, sounds great. Maybe, Erin, you can quickly explain where to post the questions. Yeah, if you aren't familiar with the Zoom technology, um, then uh, there's a Q&A section. And if you put your question through the Q&A section, we'll be able to see that on our side. So, um, and then we'll get to them at the end. Wonderful. So let me walk you through some research findings that we have in regard to uh, advisors. Um, so briefly again, CSP, what are we doing? Why do we even talk about this topic? As I think most of you know, we are the first and still the only university unit that's really focused on private wealth and sustainable development. We are a spin-off of the Impact Investing for the Next Generation program that we launched at Harvard in 2015, funded by wealth owners. And importantly, we really pursue two areas of activity. It's knowledge generation and knowledge dissemination. And the knowledge generation, there's academic research and applied research and I will talk a little bit about some findings from the academic research side, in particular, actually pieces out of my PhD that I started at, gee, I already forgot, I think about 2012, uh, done a lot of interviews with advisors, et cetera, and we'll share some of those scientific research findings with you. And then Taryn is actually gonna talk about this um, applied research field where, for example, she ran a basically benchmark of more than 20 European private banks. Um, in terms of knowledge dissemination, we run training programs for students, of course, for wealth owners. Many of you are um, familiar with our Harvard Zurich Next Gen Impact Investing Program, and we also run training programs for professionals, in particular private bankers. And again, uh, actually, Taryn set that up, so she's going to share some of her experiences from that type of work. So let me get into it, um, what I'm going to talk about, and I'll start right away with the bottom line of um, my contribution here. And that is really three points. One, that advisors really are critical for any wealth owner to implement the strategy. And I think, Paolo, you already really teed that up very well, that this is just such an important topic to consider uh, diligently as an investor, in particular in the beginning of your journey. And the second piece then is to really think that um, most private investors are actually not satisfied with their non-impact advisors. So if you know, you're sort of lost with your advisors that are not focused on impact, though that's actually quite common with other uh, investors as well. And the third piece is really sharing some results of our research that mainstream advisors and specialist, specialist advisors, advisors focused on impact, are really vastly different in how they talk about sustainable finance. And their job really, I think it's really fascinating. So first of all, the starting point. The, I'm really... Um, amazed by time and again studies, surveys, our personal experiences that show the same thing time and again, that a very large percentage of wealth owners are really interested in sustainable finance, 
Um, surveys usually find that more than half, about 60% of high net worth individuals are really interested in sustainable finance, but less than 10% are actually invested in sustainable finance. And uh, as I always put it, this drives me nuts because in essence, we have uh, on one side a lot of wealth concentration, a very few individuals who can really have an impact in the world. And on the other side, we have this fantastic toolbox now that is sustainable finance to deploy that wealth for sustainable development, but uh, it's not really coming together yet. And the big question mark here is why? Why are so many wealth owners interested in the field, but not yet invested? And the key point here is really thinking through the capacity of wealth owners to act upon their interests, such as in sustainable finance. And the way we usually put it, in particular in our Harvard Zurich program, is that wealth owners have basically three areas of capacity to implement their strategies. One area is, of course, their internal expertise and bandwidth. So what Paolo did in actually training himself and really putting himself to work full time, not everybody can do that, of course. And also, as Paolo mentioned, of course, your own time availability goes up and down depending on your life situation. Then, of course, the second area of capacity is networks, is peers, uh, tonic, the impact, per mimic, all these types of networks. CSP, of course, can be very helpful here as well. But again, those peers, also their availability is um, volatile throughout time, et cetera. So really the third area of capacity for wealth owners to deploy their uh, interest in, in, in capital and is really advisors. Those are the intermediaries, people that you actually pay that get up every morning in order to go to work on the implementation of your investment strategies. So if you think about it, that really advisor intermediaries are a key component of your capacity. And actually, if you look into research, what we find time and again is that in our capitalistic system today, intermediaries are incredibly important for any type of development in society. And uh, in private wealth management in particular, those are the advisors. I myself actually started my journey as a sustainability analyst at a, at a bank at Fontobel and was really struck by the fact that the bank would be doing so much to develop sustainable investing strategies but whether or not those strategies actually resulted in client capital being invested ultimately depended really only on the single note, the advisors that may or may not talk about this topic with their clients. And what we know today from academic research is that yes, advisors are incredibly important in this field and they're also very, very poorly understood. Now, if we look into how satisfied uh, investors actually are with their advisors, the picture is a little bit mixed. We just ran a um, survey together with the impact, uh, quite a small group here, but 30 ultra high net worth US based families. We asked them about their level of satisfaction with their advisors, both impact investing specialists or uh, mainstream advisors within the family office and their private bank. And what we found was that really, um, if you're not satisfied with your non-impact specialists, both in your family office or in your bank, you're not alone because we see this very strongly also within, for example, that sample. What we do find as well, though, is that those families who actually do employ in-house impact investing specialists or that really work with independent impact investing consultants, as Paolo does, they're actually very satisfied with their services. So the bottom line here is don't be surprised if you are not satisfied right now with the mainstream advice that you're getting. Most people actually aren't. But on the other hand, if you really seek the specialist advice, you can expect to be quite satisfied with the advice you would be getting. Uh, if you look at larger samples, the picture is actually the same. Fonto will just ran a very large survey with about 5,000 individuals in Europe. And here what we found is very, very much the same, that about 60% of the private investors were unaware of ESG, sustainable investing, and about 50% would like to get more information from their advisors. Right? So bottom line here again is don't necessarily expect to be yet uh, satisfied with the advice that you would be getting. What we found in our benchmarking of private banks, right, Taron, what you did was most banks have the solutions ready, uh, they just don't train their advisors sufficiently yet. So that's the really, really common picture. Now let me tell you a bit about the narratives that um, advisors um, usually follow within mainstream banks or um, sustainable investing private banks. And what we mean with that is um, basically we explored how advisors talk about their job, financial markets, their clients, and sustainable investing. And um, we asked advisors in two types of banks. Uh, one, we went into two very large mainstream private banks, 
that also offer sustainable investing solutions. Um, we call them Global Bank and Swiss Bank. We had to, of course, um, hide the names of those banks. And we also did the same with advisors within sustainable investing focused private banks. We did interviews in total with about 30 advisors. And um, we also actually put those advisors in front of high net worth individuals and observed those interactions. So we have about 30 interviews and about 18 hours of observations of client advisor interactions. And I want to share with you briefly um, what we found. So basically, if you compare the way advisors of mainstream banks and sustainable finance banks talk about their job, what we see is the following. So at mainstream banks, the advisors usually start their conversations highlighting how complex financial markets are. So standard uh, quote we would find is, for example, it's complicated, the finance world is complex, it can't be calculated, and we really have black swan events time and again, right? So events that have really high implications that we couldn't forecast. So the mainstream advisors usually set the context of investing as something that's really complicated. Then usually the advisors would then, uh, when they talk about their clients, say, well, really our clients are quite simplistic. Basically what they want is, here's a quote, I see that many customers have to take care of many other things and don't want to have to deal with buy or sell decisions. Instead they say, you take this over and we'll speak again in three or six months. So the narrative here in mainstream banks is usually that clients simply want to be, uh, you know, having this complexity of financial markets be taken care of. And then the way these advisors, right, that talk this way, consider themselves as really as a trusted salespeople. They make a point of, for example, building relationships with younger uh, members of the family. And they really also see themselves as salespeople, right? They build up trust on one side and then uh, way into a selling financial product on the other side. We have, for example, a quote that really makes analogy even to selling cars, when advisors said, we are ideas and stories tellers and story sellers. We say you already have a BMW, but we've got the new five series here, right? So they refer, they're talking about financial products, but they even, when they talk about it to us as researchers, they make a point of, they're almost like car sellers. And in that situation, sustainable investing is really a nuisance. So we found that the advisors really, at mainstream banks very clearly follow this type of narrative in their head. Markets are complicated, customers are simplistic, we are really trusted salespeople, we take care of all those complexities. Oh, and this whole sustainable investing stuff is just too complicated. So a quote that we got by interviewing actually the head of a whole uh, desk at a large private bank was, and I quote, stupidly, if a customer were totally interested in sustainable investing, he would come back with a lot of questions. It's a Pandora's box. So sorry, the sustainability topic could be a big one, no question. And personally, I find it a massively good topic but purely as a businessman, it's a question of efficiency, so I just leave it. So in that context, in many mainstream banks, advisors simply perceive sustainable investing as too complicated to take it up because financial markets are already too complicated. Now, what I find fascinating is that in sustainable investing focused private banks, the advisors turn this narrative totally on their head. So what we found was the following. Usually advisors in sustainable investing focused private banks uh, start out the conversation totally different. They start the conversation right away saying, hey, by the way, we think financial markets are totally flawed. And um, basically the incentive structures are rigged and not in the interest of the clients, but really in the interest of banks. And they would uh, say things such as, and I quote, all the energy goes into inventing new mathematical analysis tools away from the customer. The customer doesn't want that. So the purpose of the finance industry is simplified to make money with money. It has become decoupled, right? So what the advisors at those specialist banks would say, actually the financial industry is, has started to be self-serving, has been decoupled from the interests of the clients. When you then ask those advisors at sustainable investing focused banks to talk about how they see their clients, they actually basically what we call uh, do a complexity flip. So they actually say, well, financial markets are actually not so complicated, they're flawed, but what's complex is actually our clients. So they would say uh, things such as, and this is the CEO of a sustainability finance um, private bank, and I quote him, our customers have ideas about energy supply, social topics, human rights and such, sometimes very deep, very informed. Everyone has totally different ideas about what sustainability is and how it relates to his money. So those advisors, they really turn this whole narrative on its head, right? They say financial markets are not so complicated, but the interests of our clients are really complicated, in particular in regards to sustainability. And those advisors then really see their role, not as that of a trusted salesperson, but really as that of a mentor, a mentor who helps their clients deal with their complex um, interests 
in regard to investing and sustainability. So quotes that we got here by interviewing those advisors were, for example, I don't think we see ourselves as a bank. We don't call ourselves bankers. We move capital markets and sustainable development onto a sensible trajectory. Or another quote that we brought, uh, got was, um, everyone has different ideas about what sustainability is, how it relates to money. To bring that together is one of our main tasks. Or the coaching and guidance and the interaction about these sustainability topics with the customers is certainly one of our main tasks. So these advisors, right, they still need an area of complexity that they help their clients to deal with. Otherwise, it wouldn't be needed. But uh, whereas mainstream banks say financial markets are super complicated, your interests as a client are simple. And by the way, sustainability is out of this um, scope here. Um, they advise that sustainable finance private banks turn around. They say financial markets are not so complicated, but you're being screwed over by mainstream banks. Your interests as a client are complicated, and that's where we help you with, and our role as advisors. And here, what those banks do, not surprisingly, of course, is they position sustainability, sustainable investing as basically the cure to many faults of financial markets today. And quotes that we found here uh, by talking to advisors were, for example, I think we're going back to the roots. We can explain our clients exactly what's in the portfolio. We know what the companies do. So they really keep making a point that basically sustainable investing helps investors and banks get back to the roots of what, sustain, of what investing is actually all about. And uh, the reposition sustainable investing as a solution to many of the flaws. And um, so to close it off, I think what we find here is really, really fascinating. It makes me wonder also a little bit about how well sustainable investing can actually be mainstreamed at large banks, at mainstream banks, because uh, it really adds a bit of a conundrum to advisors at large banks, right? They will say, well, everything's already so complicated and there's really high actually resistance um, oftentimes to now add on this whole topic of sustainable investing, which is multi-layered, personal values, general trends, et cetera and uh, really adding more complexity to this whole situation. Whereas, of course, sustainable investing banks have turned this whole thing around and said, well, by looking at sustainable investing, we actually help you as a client to um, come to terms with how you want to invest. So very, very different narratives that we found in banks. So to wrap it up and head over to town, so what we really see is, yes, again, my dear advisors are very important for you to implement your strategies, important to spend the time on uh, figuring that out and understanding that very well. If you're not satisfied, second point, if you're not satisfied with the advice you get from your mainstream uh, advisors, you're not alone. About half of other um, investors that are not working with specialist advisors are not satisfied either. And the third thing is, if you always get the same story from your mainstream banker, well, no surprise necessarily either, because what we find is yet yeah, that yes, bankers in large mainstream banks are following a very different narrative than a specialist advisors and that narrative usually is not conducive to talking about sustainable investing because it's simply too much to add to their uh, daily job. Yeah, that's that's all really interesting. It really shows that um, everything, it's not just something that we're seeing anecdotally, but it's grounded in academic research and it's a key lever. So it, it really points to advisors are a key lever for really turning this thing around and also the narrative specifically. Once you dive deep into the narrative, um, that the bankers are using, that's what, that's what really makes a difference. Yeah, absolutely, that's so. So let me hand over now to Taeyeon, who's actually going to talk with us also a little bit about the field of work that she has been um, following, and that I think is also absolutely fascinating. Yeah, so um, for those who don't really know me and what I've been doing and why I um, brought up I'm talking about this topic is that for the past two and a half years I've been looking extensively at European private banks and what they do in the area of sustainable investing so I think I do know a thing or two about how private banks operate and one of the reasons I find this quite interesting is you know that Paolo mentioned about independent advisors but you know he was also um, going to mention about wealth managers and I think depending on banks they're also called client uh, investment advisors or advisors or also um, relationship managers so RMs and uh, the thing is these people are not independent they operate within an ecosystem so even though they might have a really great relationship with you and they might be willing to do certain things they are still limited by the ecosystem that they are in which is the wealth manager so this is why we decided to look a little bit more into this ecosystem that they operate in 
and I um, today was going to bring three key points. The first one is, um, yeah, on the interaction with your advisor. Basically, your advisor or the, or the relationship manager, should I, maybe I should call them relationship managers because it avoids confusion. Um, they're the first interface that you need and encounter when you go into a bank and want to implement your investment strategy. And sometimes they might not be the best person to talk to about sustainable investing. So in this report that I did on 20 private banks, um, it's, oh, we have questions. Um, the, the report result was, uh, I asked basically all the banks that we surveyed, do you train your client advisor or relationship manager on the concept of sustainable investing? And perhaps two thirds said yes, which is a massive increase in comparison to last year. And then I asked, okay, so how long does this training take place? Or you know, how in depth does this training go into? And most of them said one or two hours max. So you can imagine when we spend basically you know five over five years understanding this full time, um, and we still don't grasp everything that one or two hours for your relationship manager is not going to be enough so how the and the thing is how can you tell right the thing is client advisors usually have a really um good way of pretending knowing a lot of things just to give you more assurance and in our training programs that we have for client advisors that Falco mentioned before that um, I had set up, it's really funny because in the beginning, I always ask, okay, so how many of you guys are actually familiar with the concept of sustainable investing or terminology like best in class or exclusion? And most of them actually raise their hand. And the thing is, once I start asking, oh, can you then maybe elaborate or define it for the class? usually the definition gets very very blurry so one of the things that you can do to in telling whether they actually know things or not is whether they use the terminology consistently so do they know the difference between sustainable investing or impact investing a client advisor that knows a lot will give you clarification on yes you know impact investing in the narrow sense and in the broader sense there's a slight difference um, a client advisor who doesn't really know much about it will say, oh, yeah, you know, terminology, it's always a hassle. Nobody knows the difference. Everybody uses it interchangeably. And then we'll sort of muddle through it. Mm -hmm. Another way you can tell whether they know the terminology um, or not is if you just ask them, hey, you know, sorry, I didn't really get that very clearly. Could you give me a couple of clear examples? What do you mean by that? Or can you explain it to me in, in, in plain English? So these are sort of things that you can do to figure out whether your advisor knows or not. If you um, have identified that your advisor might not be super strong on, on the sustainable investing game, then you can ask, hey, by the way, do you have a team, like an in-house internal team that's responsible for it? Maybe I'd like to meet them and talk to them. And usually banks are quite open to um, setting up a meeting like that. The advisor will probably um, arrange it if it's a good wealth manager that has an in-house team. Just to focus a little bit more on the terminology, um, I know you've already said a few terms. Mm -hmm. um, could you just repeat those terms that are specific that you think are really important um, mm -hmm. for your advisor to have down? Sure. So I think a lot of terms that get blurred interchangeably is sustainable investing and impact investing and how the industry or how we see it is that impact investing yes can be used to to uh, can to refer to a broader sustainable investing like activity but there's always going to be a, a narrower definition where impact investing refers to mostly private market products that um, have the intentionality and additionality to create positive impact. And you can look it up more in detail or you can also take a um, listen to 
a webinar that we have set up on this topic, but basically if your advisor is able to explain the difference between the narrower impact investing definition and the larger sustainable investing definition, then the advisor is probably more or less knowledgeable and can explain things to you. If they aren't, then you should probably ask them to get the specialists and experts. Yes, so next key point. So once you've gone past this whole advisor interface, right, you want to look a little bit into the offering. And like I've mentioned before, there's a clear difference between ESG and impact. So ESG usually referring to environmental, social, and governance um, factors. They are considered in mostly public market um, investments and usually used for screening activities. So screening up um, companies and stocks or countries that don't really have good ESG practices. Impact on the other side is clearly something that goes one step further. So there's a difference between whether an offering includes impact or just focus on ESG. So let me just go th uh, quickly through the different levels uh, that a bank or wealth manager can offer you when you're asking for sustainable investing. So what typically happens is that when you have a laggard bank and you say, hey, you know, I'm interested in sustainable investing, um, could you show me your offering? Then um, the, the bank will say, oh, yeah, of course we have an offering and we'll provide you with a list of green and sustainability and ESG funds. And they'll say, oh yeah, you know, this fund is like that and this fund is like this. Um, you know, if you like one or two of them, we can include them in your portfolio. And that's about it. So what you want ideally is a discretionary mandate that is fully designed with a sustainable investing lens. So um, some followers might have such a mandate, but this mandate is usually constructed with screening, through screening. Basically what it means is they have a couple of screening criteria like, oh, there are sectors we don't like, like tobacco or, or alcohol or pornography. And then they screen those sectors out and they also screen out the worst of the worst. So basically companies that are at the bottom of the ESG practices. And then after screening those out, they focus on, um, on the remaining 90% of the investment universe and then do the traditional financial analysis and then construct your portfolio. And you can imagine that your portfolio does not look too different from a traditional investment portfolio, except the fact that maybe some sectors are excluded. What the learners try to do is that they try to integrate ESG a little bit more into this. So you typically have a more advanced bank. So BNB Paribas show pretty good methodology, LGT, um, Safra has been doing this for quite some time. But recently UBS and Lombardia, for instance, they've been um, pushing this in with their own methodology where they not only look at the what is the current what is the company currently doing but also in the trajectory how much did it improve over the last years and take into consideration those ESG results and then try to implement it in your investment portfolio now what the leaders really do is they not only have this ESG integration, but they also look at, look at it with an impact lens. Okay, what's the positive impact of the portfolio? Which effect does, does my portfolio have? And they will include um, more private market products or more impact focused products like green bonds and microfinance. Those are easier things to integrate into your portfolio or impact funds that um, that a lot of larger asset managers are now trying to set up. And how you can tell whether um, it's a good, whether it's a leader or a laggard is, first of all, you can probe them a bit on impact. So, you know, how do you, how do you know my portfolio is having impact? And then if they give you an explanation that is convincing, then, you know, that's usually a good wealth manager. Another thing is if they have anything in-house, usually it's a good sign. If they have an in-house um, sustainable investing analyst, impact team, if they have an in-house methodology, that's usually a good sign. It basically means that they care about this enough to invest resources. And you know the bank, it's all about profits and money. So if they're putting in money in it, it shows, it tells a lot. 
Another trick that we use in academia is that we, um, in order to really know whether the CEO is on board and whether top management is committed and stands behind it, is we look into letters to shareholders. Because in, in my research, when I asked ask the companies, um, the banks, hey, is your top management behind this or is your CEO um, buying into this? They all said yes, 100%. Like 100% said the CEO is on top of sustainable investing. Now, the reality is some banks were better at it, some worse. And one of the, one of the things is that, yes, top management might buy into the concept, but that's a completely different statement from top management prioritizes this over other things. And one way of looking at it is if you read through the letters to shareholders, top management or, and the CEO will usually tell what are the three, four things that you want to focus on in the next three, four years or in the next imminent year. If sustainable investing is not on top of it, it means that it's not priority for this guy. So that's a good way. All right. Yep. Yeah. Um, and you have a, one last point, right? But uh, we all, we're also having a lot of questions coming in. Yeah, so, sure. Um, just be aware of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So one, very important. It's very important. Exactly. Because my third key point was actually uh, directed to you, um, that you as an asset owner need to also do your own homework because it takes two to tango in the positive sense and to have fun with tangoing. It's not just the wealth manager's fault or the, your advisor's fault that you cannot implement things as fast as you would like to. Sometimes you also need to do your own reflection. Paolo can tell you more about it, but you need to be able to sit down and set, communicate things clearly um, what do you want exactly with your portfolio? You know, what do you want your portfolio have achieved in the next 10 years? And what do you want to prioritize? And in that sense, you know, having an independent advisor or manager can massively help you. Um, defining an impact policy statement can help you. And of course, we have a great webinar coming up that Britta is moderating on how to develop this kind of impact policy statement and reflect on your own values that you can clearly communicate to your advisor or manager. So that's me. Um, I do also know that sometimes you cannot hire an independent advisor or manager or you cannot switch banks just like that. So you're just stuck with your wealth manager and your advisor and you get frustrated. So what we do have is um, we, we have training programs for wealth managers where you can send your advisor, family office, staff member and basically redo the job and make sure they understand you and pick up the things that you want to have implemented. And that program is running again for two days in June and two days in November, I understand, right? Exactly, so you can just slyly, you know, um, push the brochure <laughs> a little bit on the table and have them take a look at it. If they don't wanna, they don't wanna, but you know, that should tell you also something, right? Right. No problem, thank you, Chayan. So we've got 50 participants and a couple of questions coming in and I'm um, excited to see those questions. Yeah, yeah let's pull those up. Yeah. Yeah, I was particularly excited by the one that said, what can I do if my advisor can't support me in carrying out a sustainable investing strategy? And it comes from an anonymous attendee. So <laughs> <laughs> but shout out because it's a really good question. And, and it kind of alludes to what Taon was just saying right now. And so if I can just answer it briefly, I think it very much depends, first of all, on which type of advisor we're talking about. If it's your family office staff or your strategic consultant, then probably that's where you have a bit more freedom to actually go about and change it. And there are a lot of resources um, to now go and see who are the other players out there. And I must say that um, what Theon said, that in banks we have the laggers and the leaders. In terms of the consultant space, we have a lot of newbies, people who from the very beginning have just only been focusing on impact investment and sustainable finance. Uh, and so those are the people probably that you want to switch and go to. Um, the Tonic and the T100 research team put out a, a report on advisors a few years ago. There are a number of other reports. I don't know if CSP, you have done something specific on this topic or not yet, uh, but there might be some new databases and, and uh, peer networks that offer contacts of who is working on, on this right now. Um, and then if, 
as Tian was saying, your advisor is your wealth manager. So the people who actually are investing your money, then um, there are various strategies. So uh, one, send them to the course by the CSP. That's fantastic. I've been at two of those uh, recently. And, and some of them have really changed their perspective, not because they learned something technical that was new, but it's almost like an emotional intelligence course where they understood really, okay, wow, we need to ask our clients what they want their wealth to do for them and for the world versus us telling them what they think they should do. And, and that was almost liberating for them too, because they realized, wow, like now we're free to understand truly what our clients want to do, which is great. But other than that, I think what's, what's very important is to um, look around and show your existing wealth manager that the competition is increasing. And again, there are leaders, there are laggards, and also in this segment, there are the newbies the new B corporation specialized wealth managers and asset managers who by now also have a track record of five, eight, 10 years and have solely been doing this. One of the red flags for me now is when I see a separate investment team and sustainability team. For me personally, right now, I've reached a point where I only hire firms that are specialized in impact investing or sustainable finance, depending on what I'm looking for, and where the whole process is integrated from the beginning, where there is no such separation of teams, and that's the ideal I recognize, mm -hmm. where at the beginning of every investment process, sustainability, impact investing comes first and foremost, and it's integrated fully in their processes. Maybe, Paolo, I think that's yeah, absolutely fascinating question. What can I do if my advisor can't support me in carrying out a sustainable investing strategy? I guess this has uh, two perspectives to this question. This could be that um, this advisor can support you, anonymous attendee, because technically they don't have the product, the availability, any of that. Or does the advisor simply not put this high enough on his or her priority list, right? Now, if the uh, firm doesn't have the capabilities, I guess what you would be looking into is maybe try to get a carve out of your assets and go with that capital to a different firm, optimally to a specialist in this field. Uh, and then basically what you will have is a portfolio that you can show to that firm too, right? Like, well, you don't have this capability. I took some of my money, which is an important sign, to a specialist firm and look how this portfolio looks like. And we actually have alumni that really turned around their asset managers that now call themselves an impact investment firm. Uh, Tony Schwartz can tell you about that. And uh, that's one way. The other way is if it's not high enough on the priority list of your advisor, what uh, was very successful for some of our alumni was bring in an independent advisor, uh, like those people that um, Paolo is working with, bring in one of those experts into the meeting with your advisor, right? Because then it's actually another specialist to an advisor, talking to an advisor and outlining, well, this is actually real. Let me show you some market data, et cetera, et cetera. And really have somebody on your side to support you. Yeah, it's really enabling, so allowing you to have an impact to then create more impact. Uh, it's a really fascinating field. We have a lot of other questions, but I think we'll have time for one or two more. Um, Paula, did you see any question that you are super keen to answer upon, uh, simply since because you are so much in the gist of it, otherwise we would have a couple that we could cover. This one is project the, how do I tell the different types of advisors apart? Um, I think that's something that's come to us a lot. That's a good one, yeah. So how do I tell the different types of advisors apart? Should I decentralize or centralize decision-making and strategy development? What do you think about that, Paolo? Yeah, and I think that that's the hard part, right? Because the advisor gets used as a catch-all term uh, because everyone calls themselves an advisor. Whereas in fact, as we talked about, there are broadly three big main types. You've got the strategy consultants, you've got the wealth managers, and then you've got the asset managers who actually invest the money. Um, and, and so the, the only way to tell them apart is really to, to interview them. But also, again, it goes back to what I was saying before, to find clarity in what you need. As impact investors, we all need various functions, right? We need administration, we need tax, we need legal at the boring side of things. Then we are the more philosophical uh, side of things. We need the strategy, advice, and support. Then we need due diligence support to actually find the right investment. Um, and then we need you know, imp implementation support to actually trade and, 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 and implement things in, in reality. Um, and so my, my, I can only respond with my own personal experience. My own personal experience 
was to decentralize and go for specialists. I personally found that the firms or the people who claim to be jack of all trades and claim to do it all, do everything in a slightly optimal way, at least for me, than specialists. So what I have personally done, I've separated all of those functions. So I have my custodian bank, who is excellent and provides me very um, reasonable fees in terms of custody. I have my strategy independent advisors. I have uh, for liquid assets, I have two separate wealth managers. Uh, and in my specific case, I have wealth managers who don't have any in-house products, uh, but they only select third party products because they really value independence. And then for private asset classes, I dedicate my time to that personally, and I hire specialist investment advisors for each of the very specific asset classes within private investments. Because I don't think that someone who does venture investing would know how to do forestry investments. So I've decentralized, but for other reasons, other people might choose to centralize. And you have to be clear on what you need and want yourself before going out and finding a market. Did that make sense? I think that's a really good point, Don. You need to know what you want. I, I think we also mentioned that a, a, an example of being stuck with a legacy wealth manager because your entire family is there. And what um, this particular person decided to do is decided to engage with her wealth manager, also put in a lot of effort and time, and there's a lot of frustration, I will um, admit, but for for this person it was important that she actually move moves this giant to have a decent sustainable investing offering have more impact do more voting and engaging and have more impact fund products on the shelf so that more clients of the bank would then have access to sustainable investing and i think that's also a way to um, think about your portfolio's role yeah so we've got a whole bunch of really fascinating questions. Maybe yeah. Let's pick out a couple more and then we want to close on time. I think, well, yeah, I think maybe one that we can answer in one or two uh, minutes. So that's a really good question. Uh, I think that was put out here. Has your research shown which business model for private banks, uh, like organization structure, compensation of the advisors, et cetera, is empowering rather than hindering qualified client advisors to support their clients' impact investing needs? Very interesting question. So what type of business models of private banks facilitate uh, this movement to sustainable investing um, or not? Um, do you have any perspectives, Paolo? Otherwise, I think Town, well, Town, you've been in the gist of that. Town, go ahead. Because <laughs> I actually wrote my thesis on this. So <laughs> actually what came out is that it, the business model, so first there, there are a couple of things that drive a bank to, to support good client advisors. One is that when the entire business model is, when there's a business case. So basically where the bank thinks they can get more client through sustainable investing, um, or when the entire business model is built on that, where there are specialist players. So when the, where they think it's gonna be a differentiator. The, the other um, sector, the other aspect is top management support. By far, this is one of the strongest drivers, regardless of the business model, regardless of which setup, if top management decided and is vocal and prioritizes this as a strategic choice, then within two, three years, the, the entire bank will shift. So those were two, but I think what's more interesting is the, um, are things that hinder a bank from it and of course it's it's like traditional stuff where there's no business case or where the the top management is not supportive but another interesting case was when banks think they're doing a good job so when they've moved into sustainable investing since i don't know forever and haven't kept up with it and became complacent that actually functioned more of a hindrance than anything else and these banks were actually then became laggards even though to 10 to 15 years ago they were leaders so you might want to look out for um, traditional sustainable investing players as well if, if i could say one thing also it's very yeah, important yeah. That these banks have good legal departments that get this right because mm -hmm. without com the compliance department green lighting this and making sure that you mm -hmm. sign client agreements incorporating impact and sustainable finance you're not going to go anywhere
That's true. Yeah, definitely, especially with the upcoming regulations. That's right. So we're going to wrap it up to respect everybody's schedule. That said, somebody asked, isn't it maybe also just a marketing sign if a bank has an in-house sustainability team? Well, stop talk to that team. That's one thing I can only say that it's key. If most banks now have sustainable investing experts, get those experts to come into your client meeting. That's also really powerful to actually help those teams to advance the sustainability agenda in within the, the firm. And then you can test them. All right. So, so just, just to add, it would be beneficial for you to see where that sustainability team sits in. If they sit in risk functions and compliance, then it's, it probably doesn't say much. Whereas if they actually sit with the investment team and the CIO office, then usually it's a very positive sign. Yeah, I think we could elaborate on this on this question and many other questions a yes. lot. But, um, <laughs> we'll, we will uh, answer them either personally or in another form. We'll, uh, we'll update you on that. Um, but thank you for your interest and participation. We'll be uploading the recording to our YouTube channel following this. Um, if you missed anything or want to share it, um, you're welcome to do that. We'll also be posting a Medium article with just the key points. Um, we might be able to answer some of the questions in there. And just so you know, our next webinar is with Britta Grini costelli um, and she's interviewing Sam Bonzi, who is with The Impact. Britta's with us. Um, and they will be talking about uh, the topic from futures and values to mandates and investment strategies. So really about how to translate your values into practi practical investment approaches. And that is on March 19th at 2 p.m. Uh, Central European time. So thank you everybody. And thank you especially Paolo for sharing so openly today. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, you Paolo. And thank you for Aaron. Thank you for organizing. Yeah, thank, thank you. you guys. Have a wonderful day everybody. And wash your hands. Wash your hands. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.